Welcome to Rangeland Principles. My name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho. And today we're going to talk about describing and monitoring rangelands. Oftentimes when we're describing rangelands, we hear several different terms. And just so we are all on the same page, I'm going to quickly define these terms. And they're inventory, assessment, and monitoring. So when we think about inventory, this is a record of resources at one point in time. These measurements are often quantitative. They have a value associated with them. Some of the variables that you might want to inventory, for example, would be land area and pasture size. You can get an idea of what you're working with. Things like roads and trails that influence your management could be critical to inventory. Water development, such as water tanks or even ephemeral streams, can be really important to inventory. So again, you know what resources are at this point of time. Things like corrals, buildings, fences, any kind of infrastructure is good to have an inventory of. And all of these things can be put into maps. Good land management requires a good map. With GIS, this is made much easier. Information about these resources can be tied to the GIS map, just like in this example on the page. Additionally, you can include things like land ownership. Is this federal, state, or private land? And also, what's adjacent land and how might that influence my management strategies? You could also list vegetation types. You could document weeds or juniper encroachment on your property. All of these things can be input into different maps. We talked about putting vegetation into maps, but vegetation in general is great to inventory. When we say we inventory, this is when we collect baseline data so that we can then monitor later on. So this one-time vegetation inventory can be critical for the pasture or the allotment that you're managing. We want to include things like livestock and wildlife. What's present on the land today? How many head, for example, what might be the utilization, all of these things would be considered inventory. You want to document human resources, and you could also document any kind of past management action, or I'm even going to say any past natural disturbance that occurred on your land. So, for example, a lot of areas in southern Idaho have experienced wildfire. Take an inventory of when that occurs because it's a good indication for what we might find later on. Assessments are the evaluation of conditions at one point of time. So assessments usually involve protocols that are based on qualitative attributes. So not quantitative like an inventory, but qualitative attributes. So more like yes and no questions or present absence questions. One example of an assessment would be the riparian proper functioning condition or PFC. This is a qualitative assessment that's based on quantitative science. So it's qualitative because you're essentially putting the stream in a designated area into a category as A, B, C, D, or E, as you can see in the picture on the screen. So essentially you walk up and down a stream and at designated locations, you're going to look at the hydrology, you're going to look at the vegetation, and you're going to look at the erosion, and you're going to fit it into one of these different categories. Another type of assessment is the rangeland health assessment. And just to simplify it, it's basically a lot of questions that are yes or no, or presence, absence. And essentially, when you pull it all together, it can provide early warnings of any kind of resource problems that you might be having on your rangelands. And this one is particularly focused on upland areas of rangelands. The last assessment I'll mention is the ecosystem integrity. And essentially this assessment is looking at plant associations and ecological systems. One of the unique things about this assessment is that it's um, conducted on multiple um, scales or multiple spatial scales. So you can have remote sensing data, which is level one, which is an example of these pictures on the bottom, that can give you really a landscape perspective of what's going on. Then you can go to level two. This is a rapid ground-based assessment. And then level three is an intensive ground-based assessment. So it's nice because you get those multiple spatial scales and it helps you understand your information more. Monitoring is a series of measurements spanning time. The word monitor is rooted in the term meaning to warn. 
So essentially, it lets us know if the land is getting better or worse, which then enables us as land managers to take appropriate actions and change the course if needed. We really need to monitor all rangelands, but here's a few examples of when uh, we use monitoring quite a bit. So after a wildfire, for example, we want to monitor our rangeland to make sure that the restoration efforts that we did are meeting our objectives or our goals. So is the plant community recovering? The only way you know is if you collect monitoring information over time. Another example of when you might want to monitor would be in this situation. Here's a riparian area, and let's say that our goal was to create a better habitat for wildlife and fish species. Well, we can do some kind of management implications, but we don't know if they're going to be effective or not unless we monitor over time. So here you can see that there's a 10-year difference between these pictures, but on the picture on the right, you can see that we have willows coming back, which are providing more um, bank stability and also altering water temperatures which is making it more conducive for different fish that we're concerned about. Another time to monitor would be if you had a weed management plan. So you can see the picture on the left has leafy spurge and the picture on the right doesn't. But the only way you can know if your weed management plan is being effective is if you monitored over time. So you could determine if the weed population is getting better or worse and make the necessary adjustments. There are a few main steps to any kind of monitoring plan that you need to consider. The first one is that we need to complete our inventory, which we just talked about, and we need to establish our goals. When I think about monitoring and I think about the steps to creating an efficient and effective monitoring plan, I often go back to this um, figure that's out of Boyd and Svetgar's Adaptive Management Paper. And step one, where we're completing the inventory and the goals, this would fall into planning or that biological planning. So we want to know where we are right now, which includes knowing what resources we have available. So what vegetation's on the land, what are my resources as far as structure goes, all that information is necessary to start any kind of monitoring plan. We then want to set goals and we want to identify what we want to achieve long term on the land. So sage grouse is an interesting topic right now on rangelands. And so here's a few examples of maybe a goal you might want to set. So a goal could be that we want to increase sage grouse populations or a goal could be to maintain or improve sage grouse habitat. Both of those are around sage grouse, but they can have different implementation processes. So you need to really decide what your goal is going to be with the group of people you're working with. The next step is developing objectives. And this still falls under the biological planning category, but we're going to go through how to set SMART objectives on the rangeland. The S in SMART refers to specific. So I want to make sure my objectives specifically state what I want to achieve on the land. When we think about this, oftentimes we get goals and objectives confused. So goals are more long term and objectives are more in the short term. So for example, I might have a goal to, to maintain a sustainable operation and then my objective would be to make sure that I have a perennial bunch grass stand that's going to minimize erosion. So long term is the ultimate goal. Objectives are kind of those short term steps that you need to achieve in order to reach that goal. M in SMART refers to measurable. We want to make sure that our objectives are measurable and can help us understand whether we're moving in the right direction and achieving those objectives or not. So when we think about plants, oftentimes we talk about them in functional groups. And here's just an example of some functional groups we might have. So we can have deep-rooted perennial bunch grasses, for example, which are great competitors with annual grasses. So I might set an objective to increase my deep-rooted perennial bunch grasses so I can minimize or decrease my annual grasses. Those are two objectives that I could state that are measurable and specific. I could also have an objective where I want to decrease my browse on wi willows. This is a measurable objective that can help me maintain my stream stability if that's my goal. I could also have an objective to, degree, to decrease bare ground. 
So let's say I'm in a highly erodible site. I want to decrease my bare ground, which means I probably want to increase my deep-rooted perennial bunch grasses again. So these are examples of objectives you could set that are also measurable. The A in SMART refers to achievable. We want to make sure that our objectives that we set are achievable in our current setting. This includes considering any economic parameters. Is this going to be feasible or not for your operation? We want to think about environmental constraints. So this is a great place to pull out your ecological site descriptions and to look at soil and climate patterns and to understand what, what is the potential for my site. For example, if I'm on a rangeland and I'm getting 10 to 12 inches of precipitation a year, I probably don't want to set an objective to grow lodgepole pine. We have to understand any legal requirements that might be affecting our operation or our management um, practices, as well as the societal expectations. Finally, when you're setting your objectives, you have to understand technological limitations. So for example, if I have a wildfire and my objective is to go and restore it with native perennial bunch grasses, for example, I need to know that the rangeland drill can only go on slopes up to 30% and that's being pretty risky, but you have to kind of understand what those limitations are so you can set meaningful objectives. The R in SMART refers to realistic, so we want to make sure that we set realistic objectives Given the natural state that we're in, so again, those environmental factors and also the management context of our situation. So we want to ask the question, what resources do we have? This would include land, human capital, economics, but also what are we capable of? This would include things like our skills, our ability, and our knowledge. The T is referring to time. We want to set time horizons for our management objectives. We know that any kind of goals, are much better if we have some kind of time. So this will give us information that we can use when we're setting our objectives and also help us decide how we're going to monitor that so that we can make the necessary changes or corrections if, if necessary on the land. So once the objectives are established, we want to design and implement our management techniques. Or in the adaptive management framework, we want to do a conservation design and a conservation implementation. So this is kind of the fun phase because this is where you actually get to go and do things on the land. The fourth step is to design our monetary methods. And we're going to talk a lot about this in the next class period, but basically we want to know what and how we can realistically monitor. There's no point in laying out a super intensive monitoring system if we're not able to carry it out. And I mean, for whatever reason that might be, this has been a problem on federal and state lands as well as private lands for a long time. We need to make sure that we don't overcommit, but that we create a monitoring plan that's efficient and effective and will help us understand if we're achieving our goals and objectives. The last step is to evaluate our management actions. And so you can see in the adaptive management diagram that this is where we're starting to learn about what we did and to see if it works. So we're going to ask, how is it going? If, are there changes that need to occur, if anything? So monitoring shows us if we met our objectives or not, and then we as land managers need to determine why. We don't want to jump to conclusions when we're trying to understand if um, why. Is. We don't want to necessarily fault a lot of different things. Sometimes we set unrealistic management objectives that aren't achievable, and so we need to go back and think about those with our new knowledge that we gained from this first round. We also want to make sure that when we are meeting our new objectives that we're continually moving forward. And maybe that means that we do want to maintain our land, but maybe we also need to alter our objectives to go to that next level. So once we've collected at least two points or monitoring data, we can start to understand what the trend is for our site. And the trend is just the upward or downward movement of the condition over time. And a lot of times we'll talk about trend when we're talking about management actions. Are we moving in the right direction overall? When you read about a parent trend, you need to be cautious. So a parent trend is just a snapshot view, so a one point in time measurement that people like to infer to longer durations, but really to get a good trend and to understand what's really happening on the landscape, you want at least two points, and obviously more is better. 
So just like this graph shows, you might have fluctuation in your monitoring data. For example, you might have years where you have above average precipitation and you're going to show an increase in your overall health of the community. And some years you might be below average precipitation in a drought and you might see a decline. The point is, is that the trend of the site, regardless of these variations, is still moving in the right direction. So besides the climate information I just talked about, what are some other factors that you can think of that might influence trend? There are many factors that affect rangelands, and weather is definitely a factor, but there can be a lot of other ones, like grazing and browsing. It doesn't matter so much to a plant, whether it's a domestic cow, for example, or an elk eating it. What really matters is how the animals are managed on that land, and that's going to affect the trend overall. Animals, they can cause um, a lot of compaction at times and maybe increase erosion, but on the other hand, they also can help plant seeds through their hoof action. So all of these factors can also be beneficial or detrimental, kind of depending on the circumstances. So when we're talking about trend and we're trying to determine why certain objectives are being met or not met, we have to kind of think about all these different circumstances and influences on the trend. Rodents is another example. They've been shown to have tremendous effect above ground and underground on rangelands. Insects like crickets and grasshoppers, they eat a lot of the plants. Um, There's some resources that say that they eat more than livestock on a rangeland. Recreation, this can have negative or positive effects on rangelands as a whole. As far as our natural resources go, Recreation's often detrimental. Think about off-road vehicles, for example. But on the flip side, it can be really economically, um, it can do a lot of great things for the economy of, of certain areas. So it, there's trade-offs, and you just have to be aware of these trade-offs. So in the next class, we're going to talk about different methods that we use to measure rangelands. But between now and then, I want you to watch the video that's on the next screen. Because I think it's important that you see that people are monitoring and seeing why it's so critical. If we want to maintain our rangelands and make sure they're sustainable for generations to come, then monitoring is really a critical step. And I think it's one of the most fun parts of range management.